Okay. So this part is just copied and pasted from the homework assignment. So that's the starting point. So the next thing I did, you know, I tried to document my steps as much as I possibly can. So the next step is um, using the definition of implication. So the definition of implication says, you know, the left-hand side, which is this part here, has to be negated. And then this part here, the uh, implication operator becomes an OR operator. So that's you know, by the, you know, basically how implication can be defined. And then the next step is by applying the Morgan's Law, because this negation applies to this OR over here. So whenever you have a negation of an OR or the negation of an AND, you can apply the Morgan's Law. So the Morgan's Law says you'll negate um, everything in the operator that is being, you know, where the negation applies to. So in this case, you know, P is negated to become not P. Technically, the negation of uh, Q and R is also negated, but then we double, we then, but then we ended up with double negation, which cancels out, and so we only have Q and R left. Is that part okay? All right. Uh, I haven't done a single thing to the right hand side up to this point. The next step also does not do a single thing to the right hand side. So the next step is to use the associative law to get rid of the extra pair of parentheses, which is highlighted here, because they are really not needed. So now we have not P and Q and R on one side, and then we have you know, the other one is P or S, the whole thing, and T on the other side. Are we doing okay up to this point? Okay. So this is where you know, things can go in several directions, okay? You can carry out distribution with this thing here, but it's not gonna help you. Because if you carry out a distribution on this side, then you're gonna end up with you know, two additional conjunctive terms that are connected by a disjunction. So that means you know, it just makes things worse, okay, in, in some way. But is that way not workable? The answer is no, it will still work. So in other words, you are still driving to Los Angeles, but instead of taking Highway 5, you decide, I'm going to take Highway 1. It just takes a long, a little bit longer to get there, but you will get there, okay? So this is the shorter path you're taking basically Highway 5. So the way I apply FOIL is a 3 by 2. 3 is coming from this side, 2 is referring to this side over here. So in this case, your distribution you know, looks like this, okay? So if I were to talk about what is a three by two foil, it is ABC as one thing or DE as the other thing, okay? So I'm putting extra parentheses just to emphasize you know, what this looks like, okay? So you look at this and go like, but we never talked about this. Well, that is correct. We never really talked about this, but we talked about the most basic distributed law that can extend to handle this. Okay, so the way we do this, okay, so let's take a look at the distributive law that we actually talked about, okay, because I, I think this, is, this part is important, not only for this class, but also in general, how you deal with algebra. So the one distributive law that we did talk about is, you know, if we have A plus BC, that becomes A plus B times A plus C, or and, okay, so the plus is really the or, and then the and, the, the multiplication is the and, okay. So are we okay with this one? Pretty sure I you know, actually included that as a part of the homework assignment description. Okay, so that part we know. So now what we do is we look at ABC, the entire thing as A, and then we look at DE as you know, BC. So the result of doing that is we now have uh, what we have uh, ABC, the whole thing, or D, and ABC, the whole thing, or E. Are we okay with this? Okay. So now you look at each one and you go like, what can we do? Well, each one is a disjunction of a conjunction. Because you know, now if you say, oh, but we never see it this way, fine, you know, use commutative law and flip the order so that it looks right. Okay? So we will do it like this. Okay, so we have E plus A B C E plus A B C. So, is that okay? Commute, commutative law, you, know, you can exchange the order. So now it looks like, oh, okay, we can, can we still apply this? Because you know, we only have two terms over here, and there are three terms over here. What are we going to do? 
Well, do the reverse of associative, you know, where you introduce extra parentheses if you want to really make it completely rule-based, okay? So now you can say, oh, okay, I can group A, B together, or I can group B, C together. It doesn't matter which way. We'll just group B, C together like that. And then over here, it's the same way. We have A and then B, C grouped together. And I think I'm missing a parenthesis on the other one too. There we go. Yep, okay. So it's good to have an editor that matches parentheses for you because otherwise I cannot keep track of all the parentheses like this. Okay, so now what you do is you look at this D at this as this A over here, look at this B as this A over here, and then look at this C as this B C over here. So now we have all the things in the right places and we can apply distribution. So when we apply distribution, this becomes um, D plus A and D plus B C as a whole. Okay, and then the other side is kind of the same deal. B, e plus A, and then E plus B, C as a whole, like so. We good? Okay, so now we look at this and go like, well, we still do not have a C and F, but we're getting pretty close, okay? So now you look at this and go like, can I apply distribution again? The answer is yes, look at this pattern here. That looks exactly like this from the structural perspective. So you apply distribution again. So we keep the same, you know, D plus A. Okay, I'm just gonna copy and paste. I'm too lazy to copy by hand. So now we look at this one here and go like, oh, I can apply you know, that trick again. So this whole thing, okay, I'm trying to decide how to do this. Okay, I'll just you know, put this in an extra parenthesis and then delete the original one. So now this becomes you know, D plus B and then D plus C, and then this term is now taken care of, get rid of it. Same thing over here. So now we have what? E plus B times E plus C, and then take the original term out, like that, okay, delete. So that's how you can apply you know, a three by two foil. Is that okay? And I did not use any rule other than what was already introduced in as a part of the homework assignment. The rest is really the application of those rules. Okay, so is this part okay? Because you know, once you understand what is a three by two or six way foil, then we can say, oh, okay, let's do it. There are three things here, and then there are two things here. So that's how we can apply a six-way foil, which ended up with something that is, eh, it looks a little horrendous, but it's not too bad, okay? That's what we end up with with the foil. And then we just do a bunch of simplification. The first step is to use the associative law to remove all the unnecessary parentheses. So you can see you know, this pair is gone, this pair is gone, and so is this pair. And then the next step, you know, once we remove all the parentheses, then we can see, oh, look at this. This has you know, not P or P, which is a one. Pretty sure you know, that is also documented as one of the algebra rules in, as a part of the homework assignment. So once you apply that, then you just say, oh, any true or whatever is always just true. But then when you have true and blah, 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 then, then the true is unnecessary because it's the identity of conjunction so you're left with basically just this part here, and that is the answer. And I think this is as simple as it gets. In other words, there's no way to apply absorption in this case to absorb anything. You can apply, let's see, so resolution can be applied to generate some additional terms, but it's not gonna make anything simpler. I don't think you, know, you can make it simpler by applying uh, resolution. So do we have any questions about these derivations, these steps of derivation? Questions? Yes. Uh, my statement, be shorter, it means it is wrong. Hmm? Is my statement, be shorter, it means it is wrong. Not necessarily, okay? You know, there may be a simplification that I have overlooked. It is possible. Okay, so here's the next question. How can you double check your answer and see whether it is still representing the original uh, expression? 
you can use a truth table, you can use a program, you can write a C program to do that, okay? So does anyone know how to do that? Can someone, okay, or do you guys want me to show you how to do it? You want me to show you how to do it? Okay. So the only thing, that the only operator that is not uh, present in C++ is implication. So you can always implement that. But for those people who say, I don't, I don't have a compiler installed, I don't know how to use a compiler, you can just use a spreadsheet. So this is what I did you know, with, a, with a spreadsheet. I generated the entire truth table. You go like, how do I generate a truth table like this? Um, for, you know, I just have an equation like this, and you know, this equation applies, it basically takes into consideration of the column and the row number of a cell. So if you just replicate this equation over the entire rectangular region, it will automatically populate you know, the values of P, Q, R, S, T, um, you know, and then you have the, the entire truth table, all 32 rows of it, okay? The equation that I use here is based on the base conversion, um, the base conversion formula that I also use in CISB 310. And I can definitely see an overlap between this class and my CISP 310, including CISP 310 from past semesters. So that's basically how I just convert um, you know, 0 to 31 into binary numbers from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 all the way to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Is that okay? Now, if you don't know this trick, what are you going to do? Well, you just have to do it manually, okay? It's not too bad, okay? You know, compared to the time that you have to kind of go through and double check all your steps, this is not too bad, okay? You just have to populate, you know, this entire truth table by hand. It's just a bunch of copy and paste and modify certain things, okay? I would start with, you know, copy and pasting this over here, and then I'll make these values, and then I'll copy and paste this over here, and then I'll make these values, and then I'll copy and paste this into this region, and then make these values, then then I'll copy and paste this over to here, and then make the value of column E. So there are ways to kind of simplify the process because you know the table is, after all, it has a certain pattern to it. All right. So the next thing is, um, oops, okay, I did not intend to type that. I cannot get out of this. And, okay, fine. There we go. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is to look at the original expression and say, what kind of values is this table going to generate for me using this one? So the one trick that I do that is not entirely necessary, but it's a good thing to do, is I define my own imply function. So when I go to uh, app script here, <clears throat> and I just deploy implication. I define implies you know, with two parameters. X implies Y is the same thing as X, not X or Y. Um, the coercion from integer value to uh, Boolean value is actually not needed except for the final result here. That is needed. Because if I don't do that, it will actually give me an empty string when it is false, and that's not exactly how I want it to appear. So you know, the, the actual coercion from integer value to true, false, or Boolean value is not entirely necessary. So once I have you know, implication also as a function, then I just go like, okay, we'll just re-express the entire thing using the prefix format. Okay, so what is the difference between an infix versus a prefix format? Implied by the name, right? Infix is when the operator is between the things they're supposed to operate on. So what about prefix? The operator is before the things it's supposed to operate on. And then postfix is, you know, the operator is after the things it's supposed to operate on. Okay? So to co convert this into a prefix format, that means, you know, the imply is going to be the first thing because it's the last operation. And then on the left-hand side, we have the or of something. So that's what this or is. Within the or, A2, which is just you know, the value of P, is just you know, this cell over here. And then the other side of the or is a negation. So that's why we have an or, we have a not here. And then it is noting 
a conjunction, and that's why we have and here. In other words, I just converted the original expression into a formula that Google Sheets understands. Excel can do the same thing too. Okay, you can actually do exactly the same thing in Excel. So now I have my final form, and I converted this also into um, a formula that the spreadsheet can understand. And then I just compare, you know, row by row, and make sure they're all the same. So that's how I can, you know, kind of double check and make sure that you know this expression, you know, which is expressed, you know, in a spreadsheet like this, versus you know the final form, which is this is CNF. Okay, it may not be the simplest CNF. Okay, because you got something that is shorter, but I don't know whether it is matching or not. But this is how you can double check. So. And then somebody is going to say, but Jack, you never taught us how to use a spreadsheet. Well, trust me, nobody taught me either. But that's okay. You have all taken CISP 360, 400, and should be taking 430 if not have taken 430 already. So you have enough programming background to also do exactly the same thing, but using a C program. Just use a bunch of C outs to dump you know, all the same value out. Okay? That is how you can quickly, well, okay, I shouldn't say quickly, but rather quickly, you know, double check whether your result is correct or not. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> and, you know, to do it this way using a spreadsheet, I can tell you right away, the, the most of the time is spent doing this, converting from an infix format to a prefix format and make sure I did not mess up because A2 is referencing P, B2 is referencing Q and so on. So if I make a mistake, which I actually did earlier today, it doesn't work out anymore. Okay, so that's what that's how I spent most of my time on is really just you know, converting from the infix format into the prefix format so that the spreadsheet can handle it. Alrighty. So are there any questions related to the assignment that we that was just due earlier? No, it's not wrong, because one can still be considered as a disjunction, because you know the disjunction is one or false, okay, true or false. So I can still, it's not wrong. It's just not need. To, it doesn't need to be there. Mm -hmm. So that means you know you don't have to simplify everything. If you do the foil too early, you will end up with a lot of stuff. In other words, you know, the other path is to uh, distribute too early. So you would end up distributing this term, okay? So what happens if you did that? Okay, so I'm gonna copy the first part here, which I will keep, but then I will also do the distribution you know, in the wrong, well, I shouldn't say wrong, but in a, in a different form, okay? So let's take a look at what happens if I did it in the other way. So if I did the distribution again, okay? So then I, I will end up with not P and Q and R, or P and T or S and T. That's what I would end up with. So if you do the actual FOIL FOIL way, because it's FOIL you know, applied twice, then you end up with 12, uh, six terms over here and then 12 terms here when you're done with that. Assuming you don't do any simplification in between. But it is still, you still end up with a uh, CNF because the idea is if you do a FOIL, and each side is already a CNF, you always end up with a CNF. Okay. Did you did you guys understand what I mean? Okay, some people not, and some people do not, okay? So I mean if you have a CNF1, okay, so you know CNF1 is representing a CNF, and you have a um, or with another CNF, and you apply distribution, just blindly apply CNF. Uh, applied distribution, the result is going to be a CNF. Now, is it going to be a messy CNF, like a long CNF? The answer is yes, because the if the CNF one has n terms and CNF two has m terms, then the result of this, if you just blindly apply distribution, it's going to have n times m terms. So that's just a, a bunch of terms, but the result is still a CNF. And then you can just apply a bunch of you know, simplification and try to get it as compact as possible. 
but the answer to this particular homework assignment did not ask you to simplify. So if you just leave it as a gigantic, long, 12-term you know, CNF, you know, it's still fine. As long as it is a CNF, I would count it as correct. Is that okay? All right. So what is the main difficulty of this homework assignment, if there is any? It's about algebra. That's what it is about. It is about the application of algebra. In other words, uh, let me go back to where we are. Okay, so this is the CNF homework assignment. So the question is, you know, how do we apply each one of these rules? Specifically, you know, how do we apply distribution when we have three terms and, and two terms? In other words, knowing how to apply this when we have three terms on one side and two terms on the other side and end up with a six term you know, foil, three by two, which is six term foil, that may be one of the difficulty. But if you already know how to do foil in normal algebra, this is just an extension of that. So having a solid foundation in normal algebra, as in algebra two from high school, is really gonna be helpful is you know, in this homework design. Is that okay so far? All right. <clears throat> so the next homework assignment, which is already up, but I'm not gonna talk about that next. I will talk about the announcement first because I think this tool may be helpful, okay? You know, I say may, because it depends on you know, what kind of a learner you are and you know, how you like to present things. So this is something that I have presented in my assembly programming class already. So if you're from that class this semester, this is a repetition. So this is a tool to generate, quote unquote, a map you know, based on how concepts you know, connect. I'm not gonna tell you how to make the connections nor what concepts you need to capture. This is for CISP 310 as an example, okay? So we talked about AND gaze, we talked about OR gaze, we talked about you know, you know, addition in general, we talk about carrying, we talk about sum, you know, we talk about the exclusive OR operator, which is this one, and so on. So every single concept is captured in the concepts tab over here. And then the concepts can relate to each other. So you can say a concept depends on another concept, you can say a concept is a part of another concept, a concept leads to another concept, a concept specializes to another concept, and so on, okay? This is up to you to decide. You can, you can make, additional, uh, make additional relations, or you can just stick with the ones that we have. You can delete you know, any one of these. It doesn't matter, okay? And then the last tab is connections. So basically, this allows you to specify how a particular concept relates to another concept. So every role is fairly simple. You just have to identify, I think there's something between this one and this one. Let me see what is the best way to describe how this concept relates to the other concept. Choose you know, whatever you have already made because each, uh, each cell is a drop down. You can just you know, choose one of the ones that you have already defined. And if you say, uh, I think I need a new one. Well, fine, go to relations and just you know, define a new one. The magic of this spreadsheet is you know, if you go back to the click um, tab and actually click on the hyperlink here, it will present everything in a graphical way, like that. So depending on what kind of a learner you are, some people look at these diagrams and go like, oh, this is exactly what I need because I need to know, you know how important a particular concept is. This seems like a pretty important concept because it, a lot of links you know, go into it and it goes to a lot of different places too. So it seems like it is one of the key concepts in this class, in that class, right? And some other concepts is like, yeah, it does not seem to be very important. This is actually really important too. Um, you can also see the length between, you know, like a run of the concepts. You can see how, you know, this K of I plus one goes all the way down to, go to here, okay? So, every, so a lot of things are connected, interconnected. So I can ultimately relate the carry that you calculate in a multi-digit addition all the way to the NAND gate, okay? So 
it may be helpful to some people, it may not be helpful to other people. And you can also see how the links, okay, can also be documented using a formula. So if you want to use a formula to explain, you know, how things, you know, how this becomes that, you can do that too. So all the algebra rules that we have specified here, they can be used to label the links. So I will leave this tool up to you, okay? You get to decide you know, whether you want to use it or not, okay? Some people think you know, this is not gonna be useful, fine. And some other people may say, this may be helpful, you know, give it a try, okay? So the way you do this is you go to the link and then you go to file and then you make a copy. And make sure when you make a copy, you go to the folder and make sure that folder belongs to you because otherwise it would try to uh, create a copy of this document in my folder, which you do not have right access to, okay? So you just have to make sure that when you specify the folder, you start with your own folder. It doesn't show here because I'm already, you know, in, I'm already the owner of this folder. But once you have made a copy, you know, and when you go to this link here, it will ask you a bunch of authorization. It will ask you, is it okay for you to show this, you know, you know, have the content of this particular spreadsheet be visible to a script that I wrote, okay? Um, as long as you're not putting any sensitive data here, like, you know, this credit card pays off that credit card, and then that credit card pays off this credit card, and so on, and including all the credit card number and your personal you know, information, as long as you don't do something like that, there's nothing I can do, right? You know, I'm not seeing you know, all the other documents, I'm only seeing the spreadsheet that you use to capture the content. All right, is that okay so far? All right. This is also different. If you look at the actual output, it is different from a um, mind map. I think some of you may be familiar with the concept of a mind map. A mind map has additional restrictions because a mind map has to be a tree. This one does not have to be a tree. You can have loops if you want to, okay? It is just a graph. Okay, which we'll talk about you know, at the end of this semester. All right, it's just a tool, but you know, it might be helpful for you know, some people to capture you know, the information in the class, it may not be helpful for other people. All right, so your next homework assignment is to apply resolution. But it is also a repetition a little bit, you know, in terms of you, know, you, also, you still have to apply um, Boolean algebra to get to the point where you can apply uh, resolution. So that is in here. And the homework assignment is called Resolution and Proof by Contradiction. And it's due one week from today. You have a, you know, seven days to work on this. So the solution is already given to you. And this is, this is five. This is the entire five. It does look pretty ugly. But if you perform simplification along the way and stuff like that, you know, it actually reduces to something that is pretty simple, okay? Um, I should say the negation of this, because you know, this is the proposed theorem, which is phi, and the first thing you need to do is to negate this. The negation of this should then be turned into a CNF, and then you, you know, join the two CNF, the one that I worked on today, the result of today's you know, lecture, and then you perform resolution. And you will either resolve to the point where there's no resolution possible, you go, you're, you're basically stuck. At that point, you can conclude that phi is not a theorem of the side that we just worked on today. But you might be able to resolve to a zero, which means you know the uh, this pr proposed phi is indeed a theorem of the uh, side that we worked on today. Are there any questions about the new homework assignment? what you are supposed to do. Or how to go about doing it. Yep. There's the issue of those kids, right? Mm-hmm. So that's good. Mm hmm? Mm, nope. <laughs> I can tell you nope. <laughs> with with certainty. Yep. So I, I would suggest using step-by-step -step linear algebra steps to do it. Yep. All right. So that's your homework assignment. You have one week to work on it, and I suggest you to work on it as 
soon as possible and use the trick, okay, you know, to kind of, so they can quickly check whether you got it right or not. Either you, you can either use this kind of spreadsheet, I can share this with you, so that you can use the same truth table if you want to, or you can use you know, just a you know, program, like a C++ program with a loop to do the same thing. Or you know, also have like five nested loops, one loop for P, one loop for Q, and so on. So in the innermost portion, then you have P, K, R, S, T all having a value of either true or false, and then you just work on the formula and then print it out. So that's a, yeah, that's relatively easy to do. Any questions about the new homework assignment? No questions. Okay. All right. If there are no questions, then we are continuing with you know the topic that we are on currently, and that is counting. Okay, so we are still on counting as a as a module. So here is that module, and let me go back to the point where we are. So we talked about p of something. So p of n m is n factorial divided by n minus one factorial. This is for okay. What is it counting? When I use the you know this particular notation, what is it counting? What is n and what is m? What are they represent? You can use any of the analogies that we have talked about so far. You can use a bag of marbles. Okay. You can use you know a bunch of numbers. You know any way you want. So can someone tell me what is p of n m counting? Yep. Okay, so n is the total number of things in a bag or collection, and then m is how many we are taking out of the bag. That is correct, without replacement. Okay, so once we take something out, we are not putting it back into the bag. But later on, we also have a c of nm. So what is the difference between c of nm versus p of nm? We talked about c of nm because it also has a funny notation where, you know, we have two gigantic parentheses, and then an N is the one on top, and then M is the one at the bottom with no line in between. So what is the differentiation between P versus C? Yes? Uh, permutation is um, ordering matters. Mm -hmm. That is correct. So P of NM is asking how many ways can we take M things out of a bag that has N things in it where ordering is important. If I, if, okay, simple example. If I have two marbles in a bag, if I, if I have, if I want to do a P of N, which is two, and two out of it, then the answer is two, because I can take the red marble out first, and then I take the blue marble out. That is one way of ordering the two marbles that I take out of the bag. But I can also take the marbles out in the reverse order. So each one is counted as a distinct case, and that's why the P of 2, 2 is actually 2. However, C of 2, 2 is only 1. Because when you use C, we are looking at combination. And combination means ordering is not important. So the only thing that matters is if I take the, marble, the two marbles out of one bag and put it into another bag, and the only question is, is this marble, red marble in the new bag? Yes. Is this your, is the blue marble in the new bag? Yes. If that is all I care, is whether the marble is in the bag or not, but not the ordering or when I take the marble out, then C of 2, 2, the number of ways to take two, two things out of a bag that has two things is one. There's only one way to do it because ordering is not important. Does that does that is that sinking in okay? Okay, I see some people nodding, but you know, for people who still have some questions, you kind of have to give me a sign, because I have yet to develop my reading skills. 
That probably is not a good idea anyway. <laughs> yes. There are, there's only one way to take two things out of a bag that has two things when ordering is not important. Okay, give you an example. Okay, I need some props. So let me see what do I have here. I have a gigantic, uh, how do you call these things? Hmm? It's not, it's not a paper clip, but it's a, how do you call these things? Hmm? A binder clip. Okay, we'll call this a binder clip. Okay, so I have a binder clip and okay, I'm gonna choose this CD over here, which is all scratched up already, but it's not important. All right, so I have a binder clip and a DVD disc. Okay, two things, and I'm gonna put it in this container here, and we'll just assume that there are only two things in this container. Okay, those are the only two things in there. And I need a new bag. Okay, just imagine this bag is actually empty. Okay, so I'm really asking, if I, don't, if I want to take two things out of this container and put it into this container over here, then the only thing I care about is whether something is in this bag or not. Okay, how many ways can I do it? So let's, let's, let's try it out. I need to take two things out of this bag container here. Here and then put it here. All right. So ordering is not important, right? So I go like, okay, I got a binder clip and I got a CD over here. There's only one way. There's only one result to do this. Is that okay? Okay. So let me ask you a trick question related to this one. Same same experiment. Okay. This is the original container. I have two things over here. This is my bag, which is originally empty. There's nothing in it. Just think of it as empty. So now I'm asking you, how many ways can I take nothing out of this container when ordering is not important? Yep, that is correct. It is not zero. It is one. Why is it one? Because the bag being empty is the outcome. Is that OK? So conceptually, it is a little bit tricky to think about it, okay? But I'm only asking about what, how many states can I have of this bag after the experiment? The bag being empty is one state, and that's why there's one outcome out of this experiment. So the question is, does the math agree with this quote-unquote philosoph philosophical question? In other words, if you are to calculate C of 2 comma 2, does it come out as 1 instead of 0? Well, let's, let's, let's figure that out, okay? So somebody has to tell me, you know, what is C of nm, okay? Mathematically, what does it look like? I'm very tempted to play the Jeopardy music, like, because I'm waiting for people to hit the buzzer. It's like, I know the answer. Come on, you guys, I, I think some of you know the answer. You're just kind of a little bit on the shy side. Okay, so that's fine. I will give you the answer then. Okay. All right, so I'm going to use your C of N, M here to define the what is the number of combination to take M things out of a bag that has N things. This is in the notes. This is in the module, okay? If you have studied and you know, basically if you've read the module, you know the answer already. It is, it is in over there. I mean, you can ask chat GPT. It will give you the answer too. So this is N factorial divided by the product of m factorial times n minus m factorial. There we go. 
That's the definition of C of NM. Now, this format, is it looks absolutely ugly. So my suggestion is to go back to the notes and use the definition in the notes. Because in the notes, let me try to find it. P of, there we go. Okay, that looks a lot better. Okay, it's the same thing. Okay, it just looks a lot better this way. Okay, so now imagine N is 2, M is also 2. What do you get? Okay, you have 2 factorial as the numerator. 2 factorial is 2 times 1, which is 2. We have M factorial here. What is two? M? M is also 2. So we have 2 factorial divided by 2 factorial. That's a 1. But then you also have N minus M, the whole thing factorial. What is 0 factorial? It is also 1. It is by definition 1 in that case. So that means we have one. We have 2 divided by 2 times 1, which is 1. So the math does agree with our philosophical discussion earlier, okay? Because you know, some people may look at that as a philosophical discussion, but it really is not, okay? Because you know, this is, that's how the math works out. Are we good so far? All right. <clears throat> So that so this is all the stuff that we have already talked about. We talked about you know, why C of n m is basically P of n m divided by m m factorial, because we are counting the duplicates. We are basically saying for each combination, it has m factorial duplications when we count permutations, and that's why if we know how to count permutations, we divide the number of permutations by the number of duplicates where all the all of those permutations combine to one single combination. And that's why we divide it by m factorial. So we talked about that on Monday as well. Okay, so, so you kind of have to make connections between all the things that we have talked about, especially the rationale between the concepts, because you know, the math is one way to look at it, okay, but your mind is wired more to understand the intuitive concepts. So you have to make a map between the intuitive concept and the symbolic way of representing the same knowledge. All right. So do we have any questions up to this point? Questions? All righty. <clears throat> so the next thing is, so PNM and CNM, they are both useful for counting things. Okay. In other words, if all you're interested in is the cardinality of a set, you know, well, this will do it. We applied this, you know, just at the end of the uh, lecture on Monday. What did we do on Monday? The last thing that we did. The birthday problem. The birthday problem. Okay, so the birthday problem makes use of um, permutations and also, you know, the total number of your know, possible outcomes, and that's omega. So we are comparing the cardinality of what we call the event set, which is the, a subset of omega that contains the elements that we are interested in. So we are dividing the cardinality of the event set by the cardinality of omega, and that ratio becomes probability. So that's what we did on Monday. We calculated the chances of, you can look at it in either way, but the first way to look at it is what are the chances of uh, everybody in the class has unique birthdays, okay? But the opposite or the complement of looking at that is what are the chances that at least two people in the class share the same birth date. So they are both kind of equivalent ways of looking at the same thing, but they give you the complement of the answers. Is that okay? So that's what we did on Monday. So we already talked about you know, how to make use of these particular values. Um, the chances of winning a particular lotto, lotto prize is also the same thing, okay? So maybe today we'll just kind of take a quick look at that first, okay? Is to go back to the lotto problem, and we will pick a particular thing, a, pick, a particular prize money that we are interested in, and we'll say, can we actually calculate and validate the odds of you know, winning that particular prize? So I am just going to pick this one, okay, because you know, the Powerball number is not exactly something that, well, let me think. We'll, we'll, we'll take a look at this one, okay? So we'll take a look at the one where you know, three out of five of the numbers match, 
and we also want the Powerball number to match. So we want to say, okay, what are the chances that you know, if I buy a lot of ticket, that three out of the five numbers match the you know the five one of three of the three of the five numbers on my ticket matches you know you know the numbers you know the first five numbers, and then the Powerball number also matches the Powerball number that that is you know, from the from the drawing of Powerball. All right. So how do we how do we attack this problem? How do we look at this you know, token? It's a counting problem. Yep. Mm -hmm. And and okay. So what is n in this case? The game or the lotto game has sixty nine numbers to begin with. Okay. And of which you know, five are drawn to be quote unquote the winning numbers. But I don't want to match all five winning numbers. I want to match only three out of the five winning numbers. Okay? Wait. That sounds like something that we have talked about. Three out of five, five out of sixty nine, and so on and so forth. So how is this gonna work out? Okay. So think of it. Think of it this way. Um, okay. Let me let me see if I can use a text editor here to graphically show you know, what it looks like. So after a drawing, in other words, you know, after you know in every week there's a drawing to find out you know, which ticket or which combination is the right you know, number. So we'll just say the five winning numbers are you know for the purpose of this discussion is one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five are the actual winning numbers, which means everything from six, seven, blah, 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 all the way to 69 are not winning numbers. Is that okay? So this is the first thing we do is to partition the 69 numbers into two subsets. Okay, the first subset, which only has five, are the winning numbers, and then the rest go into the other subset, and those are the non-winning numbers. So tell me again how many of the winning numbers we need. Three, okay. So we need we need three of these. And then what about the non-winning numbers? Because in order to make a ticket, you need five numbers. I need th three of those five numbers to be coming from the winning numbers. What about the other two? They have to be non-winning numbers. So we need two of those. Right? Are we good so far? So now we ask, okay, we separate the problem now. So the first question is, okay, first question is how many ways can I choose three of the five winning numbers? Okay. So when you see something like this, okay, you have five things, you have n things, and of which you're choosing three or m, then naturally you would go to one of those two things that we have talked about. We're either counting num uh, combinations we're, or we're counting permutations. We're counting per combinations this time, why is that? Because the ordering is not important. All we need to know is whether a number is between the five. I don't care how you pick that number. Is it the first number you pick, or the second number that you pick, or the third number that you pick? I don't care. I just don't need to know, is that one of the numbers that you pick? Okay. So when ordering is not important, we're dealing with combination. Okay, so that's, okay, that's kind of cool. So that means here we are choosing three out of five from the winning numbers. What about the non-winning numbers? We need to choose two of two of those. But how many non-winning numbers there are there? You guys can do this. You can do this. It's sixty-nine minus five. Okay, and that is sixty-four. Very good. Okay, so out of the sixty-four non-winning numbers, I need to pick two of those. Are we good so far? Okay, and now we have the. Um, <laughs> Uh, the Powerball number, okay, so the Powerball number. So the Powerball number is not that big of a deal here 
because you know there's only one Powerball number, and I'm interested in the ticket that matches the Powerball number. There's only one way to do that. But if you want to look at it from the perspective of combinations and whatnot, you can do it. You can say, you know, of the one Powerball number, we are choosing the actual Powerball number. Okay. Maybe. It doesn't do much, but it is the same. So now we have three numbers. Okay. The question is, how do we combine those three numbers? Are we adding? Are we using the power function? Or are we multiplying? The C of 1, 1? We have one Powerball number, and you need to pick the one that matches. So, it is one chosen, huh? What would be the difference between that and 3 of 5 without the Powerball number? Without the Powerball number, then you have to choose from the non-winning Powerball numbers. Ah. And then there are 26 of those. Then you have to choose one of the 26 non-matching Powerball numbers. I think 25 because there are 26 together, but one is a winning one. The, the other 25 are non-winning Powerball numbers or non-matching Powerball numbers. So you can still look at it from the perspective of combination. It's just kind of weird because you only need to pick one of them. So do, doing it this way is kind of like, oh, that's just a long way of saying 25. All right, but but we still end up with three numbers. Okay, how do we combine these three numbers? So what do you, so, so how do you think about this? Well, you think about this in the sense of, for each way, I choose three out of the five winning numbers. There are two choosing two out of the sixty-four non-winning numbers to go with. Is that okay? Let me say that one more time. Okay, because the words are important for each, okay? The key word is for each way of choosing three out of the five winning numbers. There are uh, two, uh, 64 choose ways for me to choose the non-winning numbers, okay? So what is that suggesting? Multiplication, because for each one of these, there are many, that many of these. So for the second one of this, there are also this many of this. For the third of this, there are also this many of this. It is multiplication. Is that okay? So this part is part linguistic, okay? You know, it's basically how you parse the statement of for each of this, there are this many of those. And then we, if I ask you what about the total, then you just go like, oh, okay, we just apply multiplication. Let me let me kind of put this in a different way that is easier to understand, you know, because you know, when when you're trying to make connections you know, in uh, with terms that is not familiar to begin with, it's harder to make the make the connection, the conceptual connections. So let's just you know, assume that everybody in this class are taking notes on the physical notebook. Okay, just imagine that. I know you guys, are, some of you are taking notes. Tablet or the PC, but just imagine everybody has an actual physical notebook, and every notebook has exactly a hundred pages. Okay, so I can say, for each person in this class, there is there are one hundred pages on that particular person's notebook, right? So I'm really asking for the entire class, how many pages do we have as a total? If I add up all the notebooks together, they go like, oh, we just have to multiply the number of people in this class by the number of pages in one single notebook. It's the same way over here. For each way of choosing three out of five winning numbers, there are two, uh, there are um, 64 choose two ways to choose two of the 64 non winning numbers. Is that okay? So we multiply. Okay, so we multiply these two. What about the third one? Well, in this case, well, it is still important to understand whether we are adding or multiplying, okay? So now you look at this entire thing, okay, look at the product of, this two, of these two, okay? So we'll, we'll go ahead and actually specify that first. So for 
each way of choosing the five numbers on a ticket, there's one way to choose the winning Powerball. So what do we do with that? We multiply again. So, if this is right, okay, if I was right, okay, this number, if I calculate this one, should match the number reported by the lotto website. In other words, it should match this number here, 14,495. So we're going to double check that. Okay, I'm going to use the uh, spreadsheet year mark for today. And I will make this available to all of you so you guys can actually use it if you want to. So now we look at combine of 5 choose 2, 3 times combine of 64 choose 2 times 1. Oh, okay. If you don't want to use 1, we can say 1 choose 1, okay? Oh my goodness, it's different. What did I, what did I do wrong here? That is correct. Okay, thank you. So there are this many ways to win, to, to have three out of the five winning numbers and matching the actual Powerball number. But what I really want to know is if I just buy a lotto ticket, what are my chances of winning a whopping, uh, what is the amount? Oh, it doesn't tell me how much money I'm actually getting. Okay. So there's a money amount associated with this ticket. So what are the chances? So when you look at a chance in this class, when we talk about discrete probability, a chance is always something divided by something else. Okay. So now we are looking at, hmm, we need to divide the number that we calculated, which is, oops, not here. So we are dividing this number by something else. So the question is, what are we dividing it by? So think about the event set and the total number and the omega set, okay? Tell me again what is big omega represented in the context that we are currently in. The total outcome of an entire experiment. Okay, very good. So now we are talking about Powerball lottery tickets, right? So can somebody remember um, the cardinality of the total number of lotto tickets that are possible. So I cannot remember either. It's okay. It's okay not to remember that. But can, do we know how to calculate it? There are 69 numbers of which we choose five. Okay? And then there are 26, uh, if I remember correctly, it's 26 Powerball numbers. So this is the total number of tickets that are unique tickets. Is that okay? These are the tickets. This is the count. This is the number of tickets within this many tickets that would match three out of the five numbers and also the Powerball number itself. So the ratio between these two becomes the probability. So let me just show you the probability. It is this number divided by that number. This is the probability. So if you display probabilities on the website of Lotto, what do you think is going to happen? Let me go back to this website here. So instead of reporting the, the odds of one in 40,495, instead of this, you report this number over here. Do you think most people understand what this number is about? I mean, you know what it is about. You know it is about probability, but most people do not. Because most people only understand one in something else, right? So that means we just have to take the reciprocal of this number, and then it becomes the, then we get into the term of one in blah, blah, blah. So now we just you know, take the reciprocal of this, one divided by this, and it is basically the same thing, you know, 14,494.11, and then the one reported by the lotto site is 45. Hmm. I don't understand why they can round up when it is a 0.1139 something. The Powerball. 
imply that you have better odds than you do. You can imply you have slightly worse odds. <laughs> like, you can't tell people <clears throat> that you have slightly better chance of winning. Okay, I see. So they are rounding up the one in number so that, you know, that number is always underestimating the chance and instead of overestimating the chance. So okay. it's a le it's a legal issue, I guess. Round up. <laughs> okay, that that works too. Okay, I can I can see the reasoning behind that. Yes. All right. So are we kind of clear on you know how we came up with the number? Basically the same number. It's just that you know this one has to be rounded up because it is one in how many tickets? And as you said, you know we can have a fraction of a ticket, so we have to round up to the next integer. So are we good here? Okay, so this is an application of what we have talked about so far. But this time, instead of using permutation, we are using combination. But we are also you know, using combination in a weird way, because we have to first partition the things that we originally had into two categories. The category of all the winning numbers, the category of all the non-winning numbers, and then we just go like, okay, we need three of these, two of those, and also one of these. And then we just multiply the count of combinations, and then we get the answer. Are we good so far? What if we don't want to match the Powerball number? Okay, so let's think about the case when we don't want to match the Powerball number. So the only thing that needs to change here is now we have 25 choose one, because there are 25 numbers for the Powerball that do not match the actual winning Powerball. Does that make sense? Because there are 26 numbers for me for the for the lottery to take to pick from. One of those is chosen as the Powerball number, and then all the other 25 are non-matching Powerball numbers. So if you want to relax the um, the winning criteria, then you're increasing the number of tickets that can get this particular prize. Because now we multiply this whole thing by 25 choose one. So now let's go back to the spreadsheet and see if that number matches you know, what Lotto is reporting. So now I just have to change this number here because there's only one number choosing one before. Now we have 25 non-matching Powerball numbers to choose from. So now the chances or the one in odd is now you know, 580. And let's double check and see if that is 580 over here. So are we doing okay so far with this? Okay, if not for anything else, okay, you know, this will give you some idea of every time you, know, you see somebody else buying a lotto ticket, you can now that, tell that person the chances or the odds of you know, actually getting something back. Then you look, go, okay, so this is the fun part because you can also go to past winning numbers and you can actually tell what, mon what kind of money you get. So if you match three out of five numbers and also the Powerball number, you get 190 bucks back. So subtracting the three dollars, the two dollars that you already spent, you have you you have a net gain of 188 dollars. But the odds of of that particular thing is only um, let's see, what was it again? Uh, Fourteen thousand something to one. Okay, so would you do it? No, because you have to, in general, okay, you have to buy like four, more than 14,000 tickets, each one costing $2 in order to get 190 bucks. So what about the other one? What about the next one, which is just matching the three out of the five numbers and the Powerball number is not matching? Well, the chances is a lot bit better, okay? Because if you look at the spreadsheet, because the spreadsheet is already reporting this number, it's one in 580. Wow, okay, that's a, that's a pretty good odd right there. But when you look at the actual money you're getting back, it's $8. So the chances are still against you. Because for $8, okay, you're subtracting the $2 that you spent already, you can only buy three additional tickets. In other words, you know, the, the chances is not on, on your side. Is that okay so far? All right. So that would be one pragmatic application 
of combination and permutation is to figure out the odds of something. So why do you want to figure out the odds of something when you're in computer science? You're not in the statistics class, so why do you, why do you care about combinations and permutations and stuff like that? And to do, count the number of permutations and stuff like that. Why is that important? Hmm? Runtime. Runtime, okay, so, okay, so that is correct. Okay, that's the correct answer. But what does that have to do with runtime? With the amount of time it takes to run a algorithm? The number of possible cases. Okay, you can look at this as the number of possible cases. Um, I'll give you one example, you know, one extreme case which is um, the traveling salesman problem, okay? This is one of the classic problems. It is not complicated like this, okay? You don't have to multiply a combination with another you know, number of combination. So let me, uh, I can point you to the website. You just have to search for it, okay? It's called a traveling salesman, salesman problem. Obviously, it's not very gender neutral, but that's, you know, the term was, you know, coined way before you know, we had consciousness about you know, that whole thing. So the traveling salesman problem says, let's say you have 20 places that you need to go to. It doesn't matter which order you go to, okay? You just have to make sure that every city is traveled to or touched once and only once. You can start with any one, okay, any one city, but you can only visit one city once and only once. And I want to find the quickest way to do this. So you can kind of think of this as, okay, I need to go to San Francisco, I need to go to San Jose, I need to go to San Diego, I need to go to Los Angeles, and blah, 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 okay? I don't, you know, and then you're looking at airfare, okay? You know, you know, how much does it cost to travel from one, one spot to another spot? And I want to optimize. I want to find the, the route of traveling and touching all of these cities, but with the least expense. Is that okay? Well, that problem turns out to be what we call intractable because there's no easy solution to find, you know, to find out what is the quickest route. This is also one of the problems where, you know, the size or the, the, the time complexity, which is what we just said, the, where the time complexity is growing not exponentially, but pretty badly, okay? Uh, with respect to the size of the problem. Okay. So let's take a look at you know, how we can do this. So we can, we can start easy. Okay. Let's just say that we have two destinations. You're doing pizza, pizza delivery, okay, and there are only two destinations. And you need to find out what is the best way to drop off pizza at these two places. Well, how many options do you have? You only got two options, okay, because you can go to Destination A and then destination B, or you can go to destination E first and then destination A. Does that make sense? Okay. So do you think you can figure out you know, which route is better just by hand? Just look at Google Maps, look at the time, look at the distance, you know, look at the fuel you know, economy of your car, and actually figure out the dollar amount, and also the amount of time for each route. I think you can do it. What about three destinations? We have A, B, C as destinations. Then how many route, how many possible routes do we have? We have A, B, C, we have A, C, B, and then we have E, A, C, and then B, C, A, then we have C, A, B, and then C, B, A. There are six routes. In other words, three factorial. So can you figure out you know, all six routes and then look at all the fuel costs, or look at all the time, I think so too. I mean, it's just going to take you a little bit longer, three times as long as the problem before. What about four destinations? 24 possible ways, okay? You can still do it, but you know, it's starting to become a chore, okay? Finally, we get to five destinations. You have 120 possible ways to arrange. You go like, okay, I need a spreadsheet to do it. But still, okay, using a spreadsheet, you can still do it. You just need to learn how to use the Google Maps API to automatically get all the routing information, distances, time, and stuff like that. But it can be done. What about UPS? 
if you think about yourself as a UPS driver, how many stops do you think a UPS truck typically makes on a day? In a day. I don't know either. Let's ask. So we can ask you what okay, is a typical number of stops for a UPS truck in a day, on a day, in a day, doesn't matter. Somewhere between 100 stops to 200 stops. Okay, very good. So if you are a UPS truck driver and you say, I'm going to apply the same technique to figure out you know, what is the best route, and I'm going to automate this, okay? I know how to use a spreadsheet. I know how to use the Google API, Google Maps API. I can automate this entire thing. I'm not doing this by hand. The question is, how many possible routes are we evaluating? 100 factorial. The next question is, big deal, 100 factorial, 5 factorial, eh, okay, we can, we can do this. No, you cannot. <laughs> because let's take a look at what is 100 factorial. So we look at factorial of 100. Okay. It is 9.3 blah 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 times 10 to the power of 157. Is that a large number? How large of a number is it? Well, let's, let's try to figure that out too, okay? So let's just say that using your interface with a spreadsheet, Google API, and all that stuff, Let's say you can figure out uh, one route per 10 milliseconds, okay? That's, that's a gross overestimate of the efficiency of the entire system because you have to remember you have, you're relying on the API to go to Google Maps and get that reply back and do some processing using Google Sheet and all that stuff. We'll just say that 10 milliseconds, which is 0 0.01 of a second. Okay, so each uh, route is gonna take 0 0.01 seconds so let's see how many seconds we are dealing with here. So we look at this number, and then we multiply, let's see, we can handle, so we just multiply, yep, so A, A5, A6 multiply. This is the number of seconds that we need, which is eh, kind of natural because you know, if one route takes one hundredth of a second, and this is the total number of routes that we need to consider, this is the number of seconds that we need. So now we convert it into minutes, okay? You guys can probably tell where I'm heading with this. So convert this into minutes. And then convert this into hours. And then convert this into days. And then convert this into years. And now even throw in a two five here, okay? Just to help a little bit. This is the number of years that we need to takes to do this. How old is the entire universe? Well, there are some dis you know, disagreements over there, but that's okay. Yeah, we'll just ask, what is the age of the universe? 13.7 <clears throat> billion years. Oh, wow, that's a lot of time, right? No, not really. Not in this scale. <laughs> because this is already a number of years. So we now say, what is this number of years um, divided by the age of the universe, which is what, 25 billion years? Huh? 13.7? Okay, 13.7 times 10 to the power of, this is billion, so it's only to the power of 9. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's no chance you can get this done in time for the delivery today. But do you guys start to understand you know, why this is important? Okay, why counting is important? Because if you know how to count, and there's in this particular problem, in the traveling salesman problem, there is no faster algorithm to get it done. Okay? Then you guys may say, but tech, you're just not smart enough. Well, that's not just me. Because you know, the traveling salesman problem has existed for a long time, and no one has ever found a quicker solution other than something that has the factorial um, order of time complexity. Okay? Yes? There's no proof that it can be faster. 
but there's no proof that you know, it cannot be faster either. So in certain algorithms, like for sorting, there is an actual hard lower bound of n log n. We proved that already. That can be proven. With this one, there's no proven lower bound with um, deterministic finite state machines, which describes all the computers that we have these days. So even with quantum computers, I don't think it can help that much. It can change the factor, but it cannot change the order of magnitude. Yep. So counting is important, okay? Because if you understand how many you know, things we're dealing with and know how to count all of that, well, I mean, it is helpful. You can also do, you know, you can also do all kinds of other things with uh, counting because you can calculate the chances of a packet going through when there are errors introduced you know, by atmosphere and all the other stuff because you know, figuring out probability is actually quite important in computer science, especially when you're dealing with communication yeah, and also encryption. Don't forget encryption because in encryption, the, the question is, okay, do you guys know how passwords are quote unquote stored on a system? The first thing is never, ever store a password in its, in its plain text form, okay? So if we are not going to store a password in plain text form, how is it actually stored? It is usually stored as a hash value. So you know, think of CISP 430. Have you guys started to talk about hash tables? Not yet. Okay, that's okay. So basically, we convert you know, an int a string, like your original password string, into a number with a lot of digits. Okay, That's basically what the hash, the hash function does. So whatever password you have chosen, we convert it into this gigantic you know, huge number here. So And only that number is actually stored in a database. Okay, So whatever website you log into, they, they're storing a hash of your original password. So this way, when somebody is breaking into that system, they can look at the hash all day long, but they don't know the actual original password. Unless, <laughs> there's an unless here, okay? Unless the number of possible hashes is a relatively small number. In which case, they can now generate what we call a rainbow table, where you can do the reverse. You can look at the hash value, and you can reverse back and say, I know what string will give me this hash value. Okay? Because otherwise, you can have, I can, I can show you the hash value of my actual password as a SHA2256512 you know, hash. I can give it to you, but you still won't be able to sign in as me on any of these systems. Because you still have to find out, okay, this. The system is not asking me for the hash value. The system is asking me for a string that ends up, that computes to this particular hash value. And that process is quote unquote intractable at this point. But if you watch the news, you already you would know already certain countries, whom, uh, which I will not name, is already starting to look into using quantum computers to crack passwords like that or you know, crack the hash table like that. So that means it is always a relative thing, okay? You know, how many hash values are there? Is it relatively large? Is it large enough to make sure that th the, the whole system is secure? That is always been, that has always been a relative thing because it's all relative to our computational power. So once again, counting becomes important because you have to know how many hash values are we talking about? What is the number? What is the order of magnitude? Because if that order of magnitude is relatively low compared to the computational power and the ability to store a table, then you probably should not be using that particular hash function. All right. So we are running out of time today. We're going to stop here. Um, don't forget about the homework assignment. Okay, you'll get started on that one early because it looks awful. It looks super ugly. But if you do your simplification, okay, you know, it's actually not that. Just do, work on it one step at a time and write some program to, so that you can at least spot check whether the equations or the expressions are equivalent or not.
all right i'll see you guys on monday have a nice weekend and that's it for today